Let me begin by starting with some general remarks, then saying something about the governance, the global governance of finance, security, climate change, and to draw some conclusions. Um, the world we live in clearly has recently witnessed the largest and most widespread financial crisis in nearly 80 years, the greatest world wealth-crushing event since 1929. What is the, is the significance of this event? Most commonly, the calamity is seen through the prism of policy failure, albeit on a massive scale, a failure of corporate governance, the failure of financial risk models, or monetary policy. While there are elements of truth in each of these observations, comparatively less attention has been paid to the global governance dimensions of, recent, of the recent financial crisis. Yet it is the deficiencies, it's in the deficiencies of global financial governance arrangements that I think some of the most important lessons can be drawn. And my argument will be that these deficiencies in our governance arrangements are critical, but they're not sui generis. That is, they don't exist just in and of themselves. There are parallel worlds of deficiencies in other key sectors as well, and I just take two here uh, in uh, security and climate change. It is now increasingly acknowledged that, that complex global processes, from the financial to the ecological, connect the fate of communities to each other across the world. I call this a shift in national communities of fate to a world of overlapping communities of fate, where the fate and fortunes of countries are increasingly enmeshed. Global interconnectedness means that emerging risks or policy failures generated in one part of the world can travel quickly to another and affect those who've had no hand in their generation whatsoever. The problem-solving capacity of the existing system of global institutions is in many areas not effective, accountable, or fast enough to resolve many of the global dilemmas we now face. What I call the paradox of our times refers to the fact that the collective issues we must, we must grapple with are of growing cross-border extensity and intensity, and yet the means for generating these are weak and incomplete. In other words, the paradox we face is increasingly global economic systems that stretch across borders of transnational and global dimensions, and yet our systems of representation and identity remain stubbornly rooted to particular territories. While there are a variety of reasons for this, and we could go into it, at root the problem I want to suggest is a problem of governance. While a number of then huge global risks emerge that transcend the division between the domestic and the international the character and scope of our global governance institutions are simply insufficient to deal with the nature of these risks. They're rooted in the 1945 settlement in a time period where the central concern of our global governance institutions was issues of war and peace and the issues that defined the Bretton Woods institutions. The second problem can be called the responsibility problem. Put succinctly, the existing system of global governance suffers from severe deficits of accountability and inclusion. Less, economic, less economically powerful states, and hence their entire populations, are either marginalised or excluded from decision-making altogether. It's impossible to understand the pace and character of globalisation after 1989 without focusing on the role of international banks. They integrated national financial systems into a world system revolving around New York and London, forcing the pace of deregulation and forcing the pace of the removal of capital controls, while simultaneously creating an array of new financial products that seem to solve long-standing conundrums over risk, the perfect answer to the problems of risk. Credit default swaps, it was thought, would ensure against uh, default risk and could be traded. Structural investment vehicles created an artificial spread of assets in which to invest, and thus, again, it was thought, lowered risk. What was developing was a single global market in which financial transactions represented many times global GDP, affording rich possibilities for profit while seemingly spreading the risks for each and every investor. This system supported the growth of multinationals and trade flows and also enormous profitability. It created and left a huge stock of financial assets, totaling in excess of $200 trillion, very much more gross. However, the leverage it depended upon was and is unsupportable and creates systemic instability. As Martin Wolf, the IMF and the World Bank, among others, have all noted, 
The last 30 years of financial liberalization has been a story of increasing crises, starting in the periphery, Latin America, and then Asia, before ending up bang in the center. In my judgment, a new way ahead in global governance in any of the domains I have plotted and many others besides cannot be found without representative and effective institutions at the global level. It was Max Weber who said that institutions, this is the point, that institutions are determined by the sources of their revenue. That institutions are determined by the source of their revenue. And to apply that to the modern state, he said, you can't have a modern state in which the taxation structure depends on the voluntary donation of the rich and the representative structure depends on the representation of the rich. The two tests apply to the modern states, as it were, as tests of their modernity. One, a universal system of taxation and a universal system of representation. Yet at the global level, throughout most of our institutions, these institutions fail these tests. In my view, effective global governance institutions will only be found once there are new streams of resources available to fund them, for example, through a global financial transaction tax or carbon tax that give these institutions some independence. To finally conclude, can the 1945 multilateral order be reforged and rebuilt to reflect the changing balance of power in the world, the shift of power to the East, and the new voices of East and non-state actors that have emerged with such force over the last few decades? The crucial tests ahead concern the creation of new, effective, just global deals on banking regulation and financial markets, on trade rules, on climate change, on the renewal of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, and so on. But these aren't tests for some remote future. They are actually tests now, and we seem to not be meeting any of them. These are tests for the here and now, and not some remote future. We have a choice, then between an effective and accountable rule-based multilateral order or the fragmentation of the global order into competing regional power blocks, all pursuing their own sectional interests. Or worse still, the spread of ungovernable parts of the world accelerating a vicious downward spiral of global ills. It's at best a pretty close call which direction we're heading in. Thank you very much. <laughs>